We are here at the Red Hat Summit and we are going to talk about CoreOS and Red Hat. Now these two companies I love very much, so I'm kind of interested in you know uh, to learning you know how this integration works. So we have with us Brand. Brand, can you tell us a bit about yourself before we kind of get into CoreOS sure. and Red Hat? Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Brian Gracely. I'm Director of Product Management, uh, Product Strategy for the OpenShift team. Um, been at Red Hat for about two and a half years, and uh, just we're finishing up a great Red Hat Summit right now. Right. So. Uh, there are like, if you look at CoreOS, mm -hmm. there are like a couple of products there. There was Container Linux, Linux yeah. and they have Tectonic, which is Kubernetes, and then they have Rocket, right. uh, and, which and is Quay. I think Container rec Runtime or something like that. Right. Uh, and, uh, and they have... Quay, the registry yeah, Quay, product. Yes, yeah. So how are these products going to get integrated with the Red Hat or will they remain independent? Right, so, um, so the acquisition happened at the end of January. Um, the engineering teams have basically lived together for the last three plus months and we've kind of kept it quiet just because we knew Summit was coming up. We wanted to give them time to put things together. Mm -hmm. um, in essence, when we, when we looked at these, these two product sets, we said, um, you know, there's, there's an element of, of having a Kubernetes platform that you want to be uh, simple to run and maintain. People are trying to make something that seems just like the public cloud, but for anywhere. And then there's a part of, of, of a platform that you realize that the more customers want to put more applications on there, it's got to have a certain amount of robustness to be able to deal with lots of different use cases, right? So um, the things we've done is we, we basically, our, our mindset has been, let's take the, bol the best of what both of those two platforms did. So the OpenShift platform and the Tectonic platform and, and put those together in a you know, very thoughtful way so that we get the best of operations so that it's a simpler platform to run, simpler to deploy applications, but also the robustness and experience that Red Hat's had in terms of you know, working with lots of different customer use cases that the CoreOS team never got exposed to. So, um, so you, you highlighted three or four products that, that they Let, had. Let's stick with this OpenShift. And, sure. So what is going to be the final product? Will it, it still be OpenShift and you will just you know, uh, merge the Tectonics technologies or there will be a new product line? Yeah, so, so we're going to have, from a Kubernetes perspective, we will have one brand. The brand will be OpenShift. Okay. Um, um, so let, let's start with the host level. So we'll, okay. we'll start with CoreOS. So uh, what we did is we said, you know, what became Container Linux, originally CoreOS, Container Linux, what that did incredibly well was all of the automated operations over the air updates. Right. right. Um, the one thing that it didn't necessarily have was it was built on a kernel, um, like a Gen 2 kernel, um, which didn't necessarily have the, the breadth of applications certified against it that, that RHEL has had in the past. So what we did was we are taking um, the work that the previous Atomic team had done around you know, miniaturizing the, the RHEL kernel for an immutable container, bringing over the automated updates and over the air work, and that repackaging will be called uh, Red Hat Core OS. Oh, interesting. So, so the, the Atomic brand will sunset over time. Um, Red Hat Core OS will be our Container-centric immutable. So that Linux. will re replace the project. Uh, Red Hat, sorry, Red Hat yes. Atomic host. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, that will be mostly. Uh, is it rebranded Container Linux or Container Linux plus? You know what you explained. You know, bringing all those capabilities to that. So really, the way we look at it is there's there's two really important pieces. We want to have the best of the operations mm -hmm. right over the air, and then we want to make sure that every ISV that that's ever certified against the the rel kernel can continue to just okay. work right. So we get the best of certifications, customers don't have to okay. go through any process, but they get you know, brand new operational model if that's what they choose to have. Okay. Right? So that's the first step. We're going to, um, you know, our offerings will be still available on RHEL, mm -hmm. if customers want that, but also now on Red Hat CoreOS. Excellent, okay. okay. So that's so the host level. Okay. The second thing is at the platform level, the mm -hmm. Kubernetes platform level, and what we really found was when we talked to Tectonic customers, what Tectonic delivered was a really great operation-centric, Kubernetes cluster-centric viewpoint, right? What it didn't do was anything that was sort of really developer-centric, application-centric, DevOps-centric. So no pipelines, no middleware, no service catalogs and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring over the Tectonic console, so, so a richer set of, of operation-level viewpoints. We're going to, to bring that into OpenShift. So the brand that will continue there will be OpenShift. Um, OpenShift's had a, a much richer uh, enterprise footprint for, for deployments for, for Kubernetes. Um, and so what, what we'll end up having is <clears throat> if you are, a, are an, an application-centric person logging into the platform, 
you will see what you used to see with OpenShift, very application-centric, uh, very robust in terms of building applications. If you log in as an administrator, you're going to see what's going to look and feel like the tectonic console, okay. all the Prometheus work. Um, so our, our belief is that we're going to now have a richer, we're going to have as rich an experience for the application developer, we're going to have a richer experience for the operator. And then the, the third immediate piece that we'll do is we're going to take the tectonic platform operator and make it infinitely simpler to, to manage and update um, that platform because we're getting Kubernetes updates every quarter. Uh, that's interesting because I, I don't know how I put it, but depending on who you talk to, mm -hmm. sometimes OpenShift is seen as a Red Hat's, not fork, but distribution of you know, tech, uh, Kubernetes, yep. but you know, quite uh, di you know, kind of far from upstream uh, Kubernetes, but Tectonic was also always seen as you know, kind of always upstream. Mm -hmm. So is that correct? Um, so not not tech, not not a hundred percent. So uh, Tectonic was always just upstream. Right, like exactly. That was, that was the yeah. claim. Was just upstream, and then obviously they integrated Prometheus. They integrate Flannel and SD. You know, so just taking upstream Tectonic or, or Kubernetes never gives you enough to do everything. You still have to have network storage monitoring. Right. right? Uh, so that was Tectonic. OpenShift um, was always uh, is still is Kuber everything from upstream Kubernetes. And then there are some additional things that we have done that we will get back into mainstream Kubernetes, mm -hmm. but that we had done ahead of the community. The community just didn't have the ability to accept them. So there's some more advanced routing capabilities we have in there, um, one or two little things. But from purely a Kubernetes perspective, any customer who wants to grab any Kubernetes tool from the community, kubectl, kube anything, mm -hmm. everything works exactly as you would okay. expect in in uh, in OpenShift and always has. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so okay. So that uh, how challenging is this integration? Because you know, as you said, you know, operators will see different you know, tectonics view. If I'm not wrong, and then mm -hmm. we'll see you know uh, OpenShift view. So uh, uh, how long will it take to integrate it? So um, so we've already got um, some some baseline integration done. So three months we've got that done. Mm -hmm. We showed a bunch of live demos this week. Mm -hmm. um, the next release of OpenShift, which will be 3.10, which aligns to Kubernetes 1.10, will be out sort of the end of June. Okay. So that will be the first time customers will see sort of tech preview of these early integrations. So you know, roughly four month window, pretty, pretty good for two, for two teams. And then we'll see um, further things in, in 3.11 and 3.12. So for the second half of the year, you're going to start to see a lot of these things come out. Okay. Um, the other really big thing that we're doing as part of this is um, that operator framework that CoreOS had initiated probably 18 months ago um, they had delivered a Prometheus operator, an etcd operator, and a, and a vault operator. Last week at KubeCon, we, we open sourced that to the entire Kubernetes community, which was great. Um, we saw a lot of interest in it. We've actually, and then this week, we talked about it as something that will be you know, fully integrated, fully supported by, by the OpenShift platform. And we got 60 or 70 ISVs who signed up and said, we're fully behind this. We actually saw five or six database vendors in the last week who have built working functional operators. So our belief is that's going to be the new way that, that ISVs are going to package their software. They're consistently telling us Kubernetes is going to be sort of the new unit of compute that they're going to build against. Um, and, and people love this idea that I'm going to use an operator to basically build a, you know, an on-demand service that will run anywhere, sort of self-driving. It's got uh, lifecycle management built in. It's got an SDK to allow you to have all the knowledge about your application. It'll do some basic metering so you know what's going on. Um, so that that's, for us, really, really exciting. Right, now there are two more pieces left. Yep. Um, so so Quay, uh, the, the registry from Quay, uh, will, will continue in the form that it was before. So previously it was a standalone registry as well as um, a, an online SaaS service. Those will continue. Um, they'll simply be rebranded Red Hat Quay and Red Hat Quay.io. Um, over time, we will probably see the, the software version of Quay get integrated into the platform. But for now, um, the ecosystem is still, we like the fact that there's lots of choices for customers. So um, Quay continues, we doubling down on Quay. Customers love everything we've seen about Quay so far. Tons of customer testimonials about it. And last piece is Rocket here, Rocket. Yeah, so Rocket, um, Rocket is not gone, but Rocket sort of served its purpose probably two or three years ago right. when, you know, in essence, CoreOS and really the whole community said, you know what, we don't, you know, we learned our lesson in the virtualization days where one vendor dictated the format. We don't want that to happen again. So 
you know, Rocket essentially became the, OC, the, the, the foundation of the OCI, the Open exactly, Container Initiative. Yeah. There were a lot of push from CoreOS folks and other people, you know, to, a lot to of, get Docker on the... <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, CoreOS spearheaded that. We made a ton of contributions. So, um, you know, it's been a little bit now, but, but OCI 1.0 is out. Um, so, in essence, that we now have a, a standard around, around containers. Um, you know, you can still use Docker, you can use OCI. We're seeing the Kubernetes community adopt something called, called CRIO, um, you know, CRI for the runtimes. Um, so we're seeing now a lot of innovation around, are there alternative runtimes that, you know, are more right. secure and so forth. Uh, we announced some things this week called Builda and Podman and some other stuff. But, um, so Rocket, for the most part, has been deprecated. There's still a few engineers in the community that work on it. Um, but we've kind of gotten, everybody's gotten behind sort of OCI compliant runtimes. So that, that's uh, kind of the whole history of integration. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to the, the container OS uh, part once more because I've talked to uh, uh, CentOS folks and uh, Fedora mm -hmm. folks also. And since Fedora and CentOS is kind of upstream to RHEL. Right. So what, what, uh, so what is, who is going to be upstream for uh, Red Hat CoreOS? Um, so, the the original uh, container Linux, right before we made any integration, that community, that code base will still uh, remain open source. There are still non-core OS maintainers that we're working on that. So um, we don't want to disrupt that community. We'll still see core OS engineers, uh, you know, keeping that going because there will be innovation that continues to happen mm -hmm. around Immutable, right? We'll take those, you know, we'll work in that community. We'll take those learnings. We'll put those into Red Hat core OS. Um, the, the Red Hat core OS, since it'll now be based off the Fedora kernel, um, we'll see, you know, work, you know, kind of core OS work going on in that community as well and bringing those learnings overall to the Fedora community, right? So, you know, over time, you know, we, we always talk about the, the importance of the operating system, but there, as we get into more fast moving environments, like, you know, people want better ways to operate them. You know, they want to deal with them as mutable, they want to deal with updates and so forth. So. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of cross-learning between these couple of communities. Um, just there's learning in the immutable community that is going to get exposed to the, the Fedora community that we think is going to be really good. We're you know sort of new ideas, refreshing of ideas. But this doesn't look very structured the way Red Hat has things such as like you know CentOS is there, Fedora is there. Mm -hmm. So well, there's a very structured way between you know Fedora is sort of the the. I mean, the Fedora is point. Red Hat's sponsors community. It's fu right. you know, fully community driven, but it's really sponsored and funded by Red Hat. Right. So what will happen to the core OS, uh, the container Linux community? Because um, right that, now you're saying a lot of non-core developers are there. Yeah. So who I mean, will we'll, be we'll still, the... we'll still support that community and, and endorse that just like we have Fedora. Um, you know, if it continues to grow, that's great. And, and we will continue to, to support and endorse the Fedora one as well. So, you know, for us, this is an opportunity. I mean, we, there's a realization that managing Linux host is evolving. Um, the entire market's not going to go in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things. So we want to make sure that fundamentally we know how to work in, in open source communities. We have oh, no plans to yeah. change that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we still believe that the operating system is very important. It's evolving and changing. So we want to make sure we're actively involved with that. Um, and we've learned through a number of acquisitions and some good and some bad, like, you, you don't want to do harm to an existing community. Right. And, and so, you know, same way that um, we're not going to leave any existing okay, tectonic, okay. yeah, we're not going to leave, we're not leaving any existing tectonic customer behind, right? right. We're not going to leave a community behind either. So, right, yeah, yeah, because sometimes if you do touch community, it is perceived yeah. that you are kind of taking over. Or, right. Yeah, so you have to be very careful, that's true. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so much, Brian, for talking to me today. Thank and you. we'll catch with you in the next open source event. Absolutely, thank, thank you very you. much.